Monday, everyone. In the typical fashion of Monday, Facebook deleted my live feed, so... Alright, at least it got added back on. Tragedy averted. I don't know why Facebook deleted the damn live feed. I swear I hate this platform more and more every time I use it. <laughs> What's going on, Tommy? I, I don't understand how you could schedule something, a live feed, and then delete it. <sighs> but we're back on, so I'm grateful for that. How was everybody's week and weekend? I was uh, had a busy, uh, oof, super busy Saturday. I was all over Ohio, eight hours of driving and never left Ohio. <laughs> to end up at the uh, the Rewind. Unfortunately, Mother Nature was a hoe on that one. And, uh, Got two awesome passes down, at least. Got to see that. That was nice. Something was better than nothing anyways, right? I see you guys trickling in here. I'm sure that... Uh, let me share this new thing real quick. I apologize. Facebook is... Uh, <sighs> teaching me patience. So anyhow, uh, I'm busy. Uh, oof, uh, get rid of that. Let me share this. Oh man. What? Anyhow, still some great racing. Look like uh, down at Slugfest. Yeah, they had some good racing down there, and uh, I haven't talked to the guys. A D team to see when the reschedule is for uh, the rewind, but I'm sure that'll be soon. All right, so I got that shared. We can get all our Facebook people on here. <sighs> What's up, David? How you doing, buddy? Uh, Won't be an OGR live feed without technical difficulties. What can I say? Uh, let's see, man, what we got going on this week? Streetcar Brawl. Here, let's just do this real quick. I got, uh, Chris, what's up, buddy? Mike, there we go. Now we're, now you guys are starting to come in. Freaking Facebook. Uh, for those of you just joining, cancel the live feed, so. Do me a favor and give it a share real quick. Help me spread the word on the new link. I swear this Facebook is uh, trash. What's up, John? Haunted House. What's up, brother? So we got uh, some good racing this weekend. Streetcar Brawl. Where's that? South Mountain Raceway. Battle of the Mountain. I don't know. Limpy's hit it from the back and front. <laughs> uh, I love that dude to death. Uh, no prep point race at Onondaga. But I don't know. I would check with that one if you're thinking about going there. I thought they all got canceled. And I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to make that like an official thing, but I could swear they all got canceled. Hell yeah, David, that'd be sweet. Missed the killer race at Clay City, yeah. Joe, well, we got the man with the answers for you. Holly LS Fest West. I wish I had the uh, ability to go to that. That would be fun. And H-Town hitters. So there's a lot of good races this weekend, wherever you are. Let's get your uh, get your ass out here and support these tracks. John, thanks for the stars, homie. 
What's up, John? How you doing, buddy? My man, Bob. How you doing, brother? I tried. I tried to, you know, I tried to have more personality and be more Bobbish doing the live feed, and uh, I, I must have done such a horrible job. Mother Nature made it rain <laughs> and shut the race down. I'm a work in progress. What can I say? Hell yeah. That's right. Get to the gym, brother. That's a, I got mine in. It was a leg day today. So I worked the, uh, I worked the machines and then I, uh, oh, let's do this. That'll probably sound better. Uh, yeah, I worked the machines and, and then I run. I got, I got a, for me, it's, they say you shouldn't do that. I know I should run first and then go hit the machines. But for me, I do that more for a mental thing than a physical thing. And I know it hinders me building muscles. But I just figure if I can go and be dogged ass tired where I just want to cry and go home after, you know, doing three or 400 reps on the leg machines and then go take my ass and get on the treadmill at a 15% incline for 30 minutes eventually I do anything that I don't want to do. Right. So for me, that's more of a mental conditioning thing than physical. What's up, Robert? How you doing, buddy? Doing good, man. I don't run unless it's the police. What the hell are you doing that the police are going to chase you? That wild ass hair. I'll tell you that we got to do something with that. That, that. that was like this big, man. I didn't even recognize you. <laughs> yeah. oh man adam what's up thanks for tuning in oh john thank you appreciate it brother i really really do i really appreciate that man uh none brother adulting is uh fucking up my entire life right now as far as toxic goes unfortunately uh sadly and i i I just now I'm remembering that I forgot to call you. I'll uh, I'll call you when we get off of here. <laughs> I, I mean, you were yelling at me, and I turned and looked, and I was like, "Who the fuck is that with that big ass hair?" I mean, I just was looking at the hair; it was so big and majestic, I didn't even see the face. And then I had to, you know, I had to change my focal point, and I was like, "Oh shit." <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> 32 ounce curls. Oh, I can't do those anymore. I got the uh you know I'm with Heinz 57 mud as far as pedigree goes and buddy I tell you when the alcohol gets in me the Irish has uh tries to come out and have a say in in my behavior and it's all rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> oh john's my brother he knows i love him it's all good what's up hoppy how you doing brother thank you sir appreciate that so we got the uh, it's only 7 32 did i start this thing early how long we been on here Been on here 10 minutes. What I do start 10 minutes early? Oh well, that's that's probably the other reason that uh, we're a little goofy here. And uh, thanks, bro. I appreciate it. I can't take any credit for it, man. I gave uh, I gave uh, Bill at Shirtworks the, the basic concept. Like I sent him some stick figures and some, like I was like, here's a car, which was a square with some wheel with some circles on it. You know what I mean? Like it was, it looked like some shit a two year old drew. And then he came up with that. He was like, I see what you're saying. And then bam, made that magic happen. So I appreciate that, man. And he did it in uh, I mean, he did it in a re really reasonable amount of time. Um, and, and I, I was happy with the price. So I definitely recommend those guys. They don't fuck around. Uh, 
Oh, well, you know, we're not, we don't live that Hollywood lifestyle out there in Vegas, bro. Brian, what's going on, man? Hell yeah. Uh, yep. He, he did the, yeah, shirt. So Bill at Shirtworks did the, both of them. Uh, and I got one more shirt design coming out here in a couple months. He's going to do that too. Uh, like I said, man, real, real happy with the quality, uh, with the turnaround time on the artwork, everything. I mean, he just, he killed it. And it was nice. I mean, I'm, we've had nice shirts in the past, so I don't want to, I don't want to make that sound like, I don't, I don't think that those were great because those were great too. But, uh, like the way he got the colors to lay down, I guess I've learned something here, like having the guy who applies the ink to the shirt, do the artwork. It showed me that he knows how the colors lay, how to make the colors lay right and how to really make everything pop and look good. So I was real grateful for that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, he, he, he freaking he knocked that out of the park. Like when, when he sent me pictures of them, I'm gonna be honest. I was like, man, I don't know if I like that. That's kind of too bright and neon-y and I don't know. But then when I got them, I mean, they were already printed. So he sent me pictures, you know what I mean? It was kind of like, well, they're already done. But uh, when I got them, I, was, I fell in love instantly. Whew. It's not going to hit a hundred here anytime soon. <laughs> I know I gotta get them on the website just uh I'll, I'll get you taken care of when I call you here in a bit that's right I get you some sexy time with mama I bet whip them bad boys out like wow 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 oh man so anyhow I see you guys are starting to climb on here <laughs> yeah, I think we were in the 50s today, so I was actually okay with that personally. But I get it. I'm ready for I'm ready for 70s uh, weather. I'm I'm done with all this cold. I like the season changes. That's one of the reasons I like staying in Ohio. But the season has passed. It needs to be race season. Uh, so anyhow, yeah. I was all over Ohio Saturday, ended up at the Rewind, and uh, it's just great. I just want to take two minutes, and then we'll get to, uh, we'll bring Rick on and let him uh, educate everyone. Uh, <laughs> well, I was telling Bob it's probably my fault for doing a shitty job on the live feed. Mother Nature probably got tired of my bullshit and shut everything down. So I apologize, homie. Uh, but, you know, going to the Rewind and connecting with people I haven't seen all winter and people who haven't seen me uh, since I slimmed down. Uh, man, it was just, it's just great to reconnect with you guys and to get the love. And I kind of, I got to call myself out because here lately I've been focusing on like, we all have expectations in life of people that we care about and we feel like should support us a certain way or be in our life a certain way. And then when they don't, we get disappointed. And, and, and for me, that's my shit. I shouldn't have expectations of anybody. Uh, and so I don't get let down like I am in several a handful of situations. I mean, uh, I figured when I started this weight loss journey, there'd be a, a couple of people that would be like, you know, they're into fitness and all that. And they'd be in on it with me too. And they're supposed to be my boys, my homies. And I'm telling you motherfuckers are ghosts. And then the, the, thin, the thinner I got and the healthier I got and the more progress I made, it was like the more ghostly they got. And then I would see, stupid hater shit like i'd make a post about weight loss and they wouldn't even comment on my shit 
but they comment on somebody else's post about me, uh, which was like, damn, now you, what the hell is that? You can't you tell somebody else something good about me, but not tell me. So this shit gets in my head. I'm a human being, man. I got feelings just like everybody else. So I've been focusing on that kind of shit a little bit too much here lately. But fast forward to Saturday, man. Like, as soon as I got out of the car, uh, just nothing but love, 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 and compliments. And not that I'm not that I need validation from anybody, but I will tell you what, everybody needs support. Uh, I try to be as positive and supportive as possible. I'm a pretty negative person by nature. I know that. I'm addressing that. But when, especially when a big motherfucker like Lizer, James, <laughs> comes up and gives you a hug and says, bro, you look amazing. And then we talk about stuff. And then he's like, and how are you doing, though? And, you know, I, I see what you're going, uh, you know, I see all this other shit. And how are you? Man, I tell you, that's what I need to focus on more. And uh, that, so I'm making that commitment to myself and to all of you. But uh, I think we should all make that commitment to each other because, listen, if motherfuckers ain't rocking with you, they ain't rocking with you. So if I'm focusing on a hater or maybe they're not even a hater, maybe they just was never invested. But because I care about them a certain way or I put some sort of expectations on them, uh, then I get let down and I get hurt and upset. Why focus on that? The motherfuckers that ain't rocking with you, it's cool. Let them go do what they do. But the ones that are, fucking hang on to them people. You know, show them the appreciation and uh, and, and, and love that and, and reciprocate that. Uh, because at the end of the day, we can all say we're the strongest, whatever, and that we should be independent. We don't need anybody, but we all need each other. Uh, it, it, you know, we all need each other. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't need validation or confirmation. I see the results in the mirror, but I'm a human being just like all of you, and we all need love from each other. So let's all just love each other. And now I'll be done with the mushy shit, but I really had to share that because it wasn't just lies. Or, I mean, there was like a dozen people who just ran up and that I haven't seen for a while and just like love, love, love. And, uh, and I don't know, believe in God or not. I do. And, uh, I mean, I'm not like overly religious in terms of going to the church or not, but like I said, I really have been feeling down and then God showed me what I need to focus on. So, I just wanted to share that with everybody because I know some of my posts have been a little down and some of you've reached out and uh, I appreciate that too, but let's all just make it about love. I love all of you and uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, he Lizer's my home. He's my brother and I love him to death. And, you know, uh, yesterday I just had to send him a little, a couple of people, but I had to send him a little thank you note. Just tell him, man, like, I, I appreciate that. I needed, I needed that. Uh, I mean, I needed that feedback, but I also needed that smack in the face to be like, you stupid motherfucker. Focus on the good shit. Stop focusing on the bad shit because the bad shit don't mean shit. Uh, and the people that ain't rocking with you. Or the fake people, uh, you know, the people faking that they're rocking with you, but ain't that shit don't matter either. So let's just focus on the positive, man. And uh, we can all keep growing. Bob loves Bud Light even more so now, over I think like starting two weeks ago. Yeah, people are man. You're awesome. You know what I mean. You Wayne and uh, man. I just, I just want to focus on surrounding myself with positive people, having positive conversations, and doing positive things, man. And I, <laughs> even if I gotta listen to this dude give me shit all the time, because I love him too. <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, you know, I, I'm gonna get off my little my little sappy soapbox, man. And uh, I just really was feeling that uh, Saturday and and reflecting on it quite a bit yesterday and today, and thought I'd share that. But let's get down to some technical stuff because. Rick is sitting over here all all stoic, waiting to come in and teach you guys about Holly FI stuff. <laughs> so thanks for listening to my little, my little rant, and uh, let's learn some shit and have some fun. What's up, Ryan? Hello, hello. What's going on, brother? Oh, good. Thank you for the uh, inspiration. Oh, you know what? I, I got to thank everybody else. I'm, I'm grateful for... I'm grateful for everybody else because I'm stubborn and stupid. So sometimes I don't see stuff and it was yeah. good that that was pointed out. You know what I mean? Well, uh, I, I could tell you life has been hard for everybody that I've talked to. It's not, uh, it's been, it's not been a, a, an easy go at it lately, but yeah, we just keep on pushing on, right? Keep on doing what we're doing. Absolutely. And but like I, I said, we all need each other, man. We all need to help each other because it is, you're right. It's not easy for anyone. Right. Right up to the point, you know, we're all at the track. We're all the, the uh, we all love the same thing, right? And uh, sometimes, like, like you're, you're bringing up haters or everyone that's there's just some people that just don't like you for and don't even know you, right? So it's all yeah. good. Just keep doing what you're doing, you know. Um, everybody loves you guys. So, all right, yeah. Yeah, I was on that. I was not on. I was not on the sponsor list. The the vendor. I, I, that's. I, I, was, I couldn't. I couldn't believe that Mike played you like that. <laughs> so how much more money? Just, Here's another five hundred dollars. How much more money do I got to put into these things? I was really just breaking their balls. I was just like, I'm, I'm not on it. They're they're going through four pages, and my name's not on there. And I'm like, my name's on the 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 whole thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just happened to be up there when they were talking about. It. They felt horrible. Yeah, I know. I'll just go give Mike shit. Yeah, I love I like, Mike. I, I laugh my ass off actually, but <laughs> it's all good. I'm just like, how am I not on the the sponsor list? You know, I think the guy at the at Wendy's that served them that day was on the sponsor list, and I was. Like, oh, this guy gave me a, a you know free small fry coupon, and I, yeah, come on, you get your no problem. <laughs> you know how I gotta write stuff down that's good. Yeah. So, Wendy's meme coming soon. Yeah. So it's all good. I'm just, I was oh, just, I, I mean, there's the culprit it. right there. So, Chris Lane, he wasn't even there. He wasn't even there. So, <laughs> so it's all good. I don't care. I, I want to, I, I thought it was more funny than anything, but I was not really mad. I was definitely not upset about the 20 bucks. But if there's any time you could make a joke out of something, I'm going to be there doing that. So, all right. Oh, yeah. I, th I think this is the last week, right? This is the last one. This, this is, is, sir. And this is where we get to talk about advanced tuning and advanced uh, advanced settings. So, yeah. um, I think uh, last month it was an awkward, like, random thing. So, I thought I'd bring up that tune that I was being referred to um, where I was accused of being a scumbag. So, um Oh boy! Yeah, we well, don't have know. to relive it. We can, but we don't have no, to. No, it's a. It, you know what? It's actually a perfect learning um, curve. So, okay. um, advanced tables. Let's talk about advanced tables. All right. So, uh, if you want to add the advanced section, you go up to your toolbox here. Um, you go to add individual configurations, advanced, and I'm not going to go through the whole process because I already have a, a, a whole tune set up on here. Share your screen okay. to me. Nope, so I'm not doing it. I am so I'm gonna get I'm gonna get this whole I'm gonna get that thing down. Settings. Hold on. Where is it? Oh here. No, no. Window. There we go. All right. Does everybody see it? We good to see in it now? See the V6 up here? There we go. All right. Okay. Excellent. All right. So you go to your toolbox at advanced settings. I'm actually going to do it through another tune here so I don't lose this one. Toolbox, uh, advanced configuration, advanced, and then you can do default. Now, a pretty large warning box pops up. 
And it's telling you that if you don't know what you're doing in the advanced section, do not do it. Okay, and we'll go ahead and read it. If you proceed, you'll be adding the advanced tuning individual configuration file, the advanced tuning ICF. The advanced tuning ICF provides the users with extended functional capabilities that in turn require the user to have a high level of tuning understanding in order to effectively utilize the file's functionality. Understand that there are no constraints placed on what combination or of functions of the XY axis selections can be made. As such, the function and the advanced tuning ICF are custom made by you. Any changes implemented through the advanced tuning ICF uh, function will be made based on specific and calculated requirements that you set. So it is extremely important that you understand what you're doing before implementing any of these functions. The choices you make in the advanced tuning ICF can result in severe engine and or vehicle damage uh, for which you and you are solely responsible and fully responsible. So it is your respons responsibility to anticipate and understand the direct results of the, of the selections. If you do not understand the advanced tuning ICF, unless the service of a qualified Holly EFI tuner, the advanced tuning ICF feature of the software is not supported through Holly's tech services or engineering departments. Holly has no liability to you for personal injury and including death or property damage that may result in any use of the advanced tuning ICF. If you accept the, accept the risks and the, and the liability for your vehicle, engine, engine and equipment and other damage, including personal injury, that may re result from use of advanced tuning ICF and wish to proceed, click OK. I'm not sure if you guys saw that big pop up on that because I switched windows a little bit, but that... Uh, the, the, the advanced tuning feature of the Holly is probably what, what makes, I think, Holly uh, stand out from some of the other larger ECU companies is that not only do they give you all these cool tools that you could use and different functions, it also allows you to make your own tables uh, to do what you want to do, whether it's some sort of a custom uh, boost building feature, uh, a form of traction control that you want to do, or controlling any type of solenoid or anything that you want to you do you can make your own table based off of any uh, uh x and y axis or any uh, input or output throughout the whole ecu i use it a lot for safeties uh boost building and flex fuel tuning so um let's talk about safeties first the idea of safeties are going to be uh try to either save your engine or minimize damage okay if something goes awry and if I go into my little ICF here, you'll see that there's 1D tables and there's 2D tables. And 1D is obviously one-dimensional, meaning it's just uh, one access and one thing. Um, and then a 2D table is a two-access where you could compare two different parts of data and do something with it, whether it's timing or a dwell offset. Um, and then they also give you a 1D table for gear and 1D table, um, 2D tables for by gear. So if you have HP or Dominator software, you get eight tables at 1D, eight tables at 2Ds, and then eight tables in the gear by gear. If you don't have like a uh, automatically shift the transmission, if you're not going by gear, I just simply go in here, select number of gears one at the setup. And now you have actually 16 uh, 2D tables, 16 1D tables. If you're using Terminator X, you'll notice that you've got only four 1D, four 2Ds, and then one in each gear selection. So you kind of only have five 1D, five 2D tables. So you're, you're limited on on the stuff that you could actually do um, with the cheaper ECUs, but you, that's kind of what you get, okay? So what I use it for, um, I use it for flex fuel. So if you put a flex fuel sensor on this thing, um, you're going to want to fix your fueling. So you can enable the table. You'll see I already have it set up, flex fuel multiplier, uh, this car does not have a flex fuel sensor on it, but normally you would select flex fuel. Um, and then it would just be this bottom row, how much, what your, what percentage of ethanol you have, and then how much fuel it adds. The cool thing about using it like this for flex fuel tuning is that, you know, for a street car, this, this is a, a blanket fuel modifier, which means it's going to fix your startup fuel, your Excel enrichment fuel, your base fuel, everything. So once the car's tuned on pump gas and you turn this function on, it's, pretty much tuned on E85. You might have to tweak this table in a little bit, but it should start, run, rev, and go down the road, no problem. Okay. Um, other things I use it for is a, uh, if you have a belt drive fuel pump, a cranking fuel multiplier. So what we'll do is that this is a, 
with a belt drive pump, you obviously don't have a prime in most cases. So as you crank, the fuel pressure builds. So in order to get this thing to start at really low fuel pressure, we'll add 600% or 800% of fuel at 2, 3, 4 PSI, pretty much just letting the injectors open and dribble the fuel in so it'll actually fire at, at lower fuel pressures. And then as soon as it fires up or if the system's primed, it won't always just open up the injectors fully. So um, this is a, a table that is on top of your cranking fuel table that is based off of how much fuel pressure you have. Again, just ways of fi fixing, solving problems that, that you didn't know that you might have had. I also have a fuel pressure protect or a fuel pressure offset. Uh, you'll see the fuel pressure here and a fuel pressure starts to come pretty low just throughout the tune. This is a blanket fuel modifier where it just adds fuel uh, to try and, again, save things uh, and keep you in a race without just shutting it straight down. Uh, this is a boost builder function. Most everyone on Terminator X uses this. I use this on all the tunes. Uh, it's a timing offset based off of how much boost. I activate it based on your staging input one or your trans brake button. So anytime you click your trans brake button on, this will turn on. And what it'll do is when you're uh, under zero PSI boost or right on zero PSI boost, it's going to add a bunch of timing to your tune to help it try to get to the two step or start getting some torque in the engine to build boost. And as it starts to build boost, we're going to start yanking the timing out so it builds it a lot faster. This is one way to adjust how much launch boost you have. Like right here, we want to leave off 8 PSI. So we stop pulling timing at 8 PSI and then put it back in. So this will usually ride this little curve here. It'd be 8 to 8.5 PSI of launch. Um, again, uh, more ways. I, I do a flex boost offset if you have a street car. So if, it, if you put pump gas in it, you can make it turn itself down uh, or turn itself up. Uh, as far as 2D tables go, I do a flex fuel timing offset table. Uh, this one's great because we're not using this particular tune, but again, based off of how much flex fuel it has and how much boost pressure you have, we'll actually have a timing retard. So in this particular tune, if it's at E80 to 87, it does not allow it. It, does, it takes no timing away and gives it no timing. And if you say, and we have it set up on this one, that'll add two degrees of timing if you have like an E90 or a race ethanol fuel that's over 85%. Now, safeties are uh, are one, one thing that we, we want to do. So... I don't think we talked about dwell earlier on about how dwell is, is, is exactly uh, how hot or how, how much you charge the coil. So the more dwell you have, the hotter the spark. We could also use dwell to kill those coils or shut them off. So you'll see on this one, we have a fuel pressure safety. So if we're going down the track and we, our fuel pump uh, drive breaks and we lose all fuel pressure, um, it'll actually sense that fuel pressure under boost and it'll actually just shut the coils off and just kill the engine. We also have a table set up like that based off of RPM um, and oil pressure that if you drop oil pressure or you lose oil pressure during the run, instead of just letting it blow up, we're going to go ahead and do something about it. And we'll just kill the engine and it'll just shut shut the engine off until it either ACE dies all the way or sees oil pressure again. Is everybody following me so far? I hope so. So uh, this particular car is, uh, is on methanol, and, on, and when I run cars on methanol, I, I'd almost insist on having EGTs on them. Uh, with methanol, you have a lot of fuel going, and, uh, at the, and especially with 16 injectors, it takes one injector to stick or shut on one cylinder to really hurt it. So over here into my 1D tables, I set up what's called an EGT safety. Um, we want this thing... You don't want, I don't go real crazy on safeties, meaning if it sees a little spike that's hot to kill that cylinder. Um, I get it where if it gets dangerous hot, we start yanking timing out. Now, with, with methanol, especially, if you just kill that cylinder, because we could have did a, a cylinder one dwell offset, we'll just shut the coil off. But if we do that, we'll hydrolock that cylinder and probably hurt something. So we do it as a timing offset, enough not to kill that cylinder, but enough to neuter that cylinder to attempt to try and save it. Um, so if you... Are you guys seeing the data log? Did the screen share um, share the data log, or is it only seeing the tune file? Okay, you're only seeing the tune file. Yeah, so only the tune file. Go to this data log right here. Uh, stop share. Okay. I'm actually entire screen. I'm gonna do this like this. Okay, you probably see my face again. All right, you see? Do you guys see in the data log on this right here? Yep. 
All it's right. Like, well. So I have a little tab that I made for EGTs. And what you see in here, and, and what you see with all these lines, is I have all the EGTs up, and I could probably get a lot of these, all these other numbers off. And as we go through, I'll put RPM on there. You can see the RPM come up, the converter couples, and you'll and you kind of watch, and you can see all of our EGTs here: 12, 1238, 1234, 1220, 1256, That one's a little cold. 12, 1190, 1249, 1214. But they're all right around twelve hundred. Uh, degrees is where we want to be on it and then you'll see here that actually what we think is number two starts to kind of go a little awry okay and all of a sudden and mind you that this is uh 8.53 seconds into the data log and what it actually sees is so it's a half a second one and a 1.2 seconds which is faster than most any of us could do anything or think about you'll see that it spikes up to 1550 degrees and again, this is a 16 injector setup. So what I do in this situation is I yank that timing out of cylinder two. So we go over to cylinder two, you'll actually see that it pulled five degrees out of it. Now, is that enough to, to save the engine? Maybe, maybe not. We're, again, I'm not trying to kill the cylinder because I don't want to hydrolock it, but I want to neuter it as much as possible. And the idea behind this is to try to do everything in our power to at least minimize the amount of damage. Uh, this particular uh, EGT uh, happened to be plugged into the wrong spot. So, if, you know, devil's in the details, the type of stuff. So this was actually number two um, cylinder was the EGT was plugged into number eight. So it was actually number eight that was having the problem. But the ECU thought it was number two and neutered number two. Um, and number eight ended up bending a rod and having an issue. And what it came down to is all that happened is on this is a 16 injector setup is one of the injectors just stuck closed. No rhyme, no reason. Uh, we had them floating clean. A lot of crap come out of them, so that must have been a dirty fuel system or something. But one of the injectors stuck closed. Um, but if the EGT is not in the right spot, uh, any chance we had of saving the engine kind of goes goes away. So um, let it be a lesson. Just just when you guys are putting your cars together, especially when you got like, a lot of crazy amount of money into them, let's just try to. And mistakes happen. People are human. Like. I, I've hurt my own stuff from missing things like this, but this is, you know, if we set up safeties and checks and balances, but if we don't uh, put them in the right spot, we have a kind of a problem. Um, so yes, maybe may have hurt it, may have not hurt it. Maybe it would have just nipped the plug instead of, you know, bending a rod or something like that. But, but that's what happened on that particular, that particular situation. Now the Vance tuning doesn't stop with that. You know, so this is one way of setting up some safeties in the background with EGTs. Um, soon, um, I, I know just talking to like the Holly engineers and everything that uh, there's going to be an 802 that's going to be coming out. Uh, you could also wire in eight oxygen sensors. You could do the same type of thing with a lean, lean safety on these. Uh, meaning that if instead of using EGT, you could use O2, which tends to be a, a faster reacting thing. EGTs are kind of slow. Uh, but you'd be able to do the same type of deal on that. Uh, the uh, Some more stuff that we do in advanced tuning uh, may be wheelie control, uh, which I could open up another tune. Uh, has anyone seen those laser sensors? Uh, and again, this, if you have a dominator, uh, no issues. I, I have a, I, I sell a laser sensor, so does low dollar. Um, Glenn Payne at Mad Racing Parts has them. Um, it's a banner laser sensor that points at the ground. Uh, and as their front end comes up, it tells the ECU how far um, how far the front end's coming up. And we can set up a timing table based off of that. I think I have a tune saved in his folder here. So we got a couple questions here, which really, this one, I think we covered that last time, didn't we? Bump button delay. In the last episode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're back to the wow. Twilight Zone. All right. So wheelie control is another cool thing uh, we can do. I have a 2D table here. I'll say I named it wheelie control. We use it as a timing offset. I use it off boost time. And I use boost time a lot on turbo cars because that's a timer that starts when you let off the trans brake button. Um, so it's just an easy way to, to know where you're at in your run. And then my Y, my Y axis is the wheelie sensor. 
So you'll see this is a four second long table. Uh, it goes by 20 inches and how you decide I do 20 inches uh, from the, uh, the like the pinch weld right behind the wheel. You could use tire crack, but if you use suspension limiters, where your tire crack is going to be different uh, everywhere. So if you use a suspension limiter and you and you measure for tire crack to like when the tire cracks, that's zero inches and start measuring from there. When you put a limiter on it, these measurements are now wrong. So I use chassis like just the, the like the pinch weld or right in front of the tire, like when when what what that is as far as as, uh, as it goes now. I don't take anything out for the first quarter second because if, it, if the wheels come up a little bit and it comes right back down, I'm okay with it. You don't want to kill your 60 foot because of that. But as you come out and as the timer goes and if it keeps climbing, we're going to start pulling timing and pulling timing and pulling timing. And ideally, uh, once it, you know, you, you knock 10 degrees out of this thing, you, you usually knock a couple hundred horsepower out of it. Hopefully that puts it back down and maybe it'll ride this edge right here. It takes a little bit of tuning, but this is one thing that you can do. Um, you don't have to have the ECU manufacturer give you these tools. If you think of it, you can do it. You know, you're not, there's no, uh, no rules with advanced tuning. And that's part of, you know, it, 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 it breeds innovation, you know, um, again, there's more flex fuel tuning here in the advanced tables, fuel pressure, safety, oil pressure, safety. Um, if you go to your toolbox add individual configuration, in the advanced section, if you actually click on the demo tables, uh, Holly gives you a bunch of examples of stuff that they've done. Uh, and, and these are on like one of their base teams, one of the, one of the engineers. Like there's an EGT safety as someone has set up as a fuel multiplier at, at one point. Um, this is a, a boost offset based on speed. This would be kind of like a trash control because it's uh, speed versus the throttle position. Uh, some of these X and Y axes, if the tune doesn't have the inputs and outputs that the, this was set up for, it kind of scrambles them sometimes. So you got to be careful. Um, a timing retard based off of throttle position and time. I don't kind of weird. A pan vac is a good one. If you had a pan vac sensor, if you start to rock the rings or start getting into detonation, you'll see spikes and in, in uh, crankcase pressure. So if this if this would have is if this sees spikes in crankcase pressure or drop in pan vac. Um, it'll start pulling timing and, and try to help save the engine. Uh, coolant pressure is another big one. A lot of guys use, so if you start lifting a head gasket, you're going to see a spike in coolant pressure. Again, we could set up a table. Um, we could call it, you name it, coolant, PSI, maybe safety. Uh, we'd have to add a coolant pressure sensor, which I believe this tune has a coolant pressure sensor. So what we would do in that situation, we turn that table on, we name it, we'll do a timing offset. Man, we'll maybe do it um, by coolant pressure. And then maybe we'll do it by RPM. Okay, so we'll scale it. Maybe we'll go to 7,000 RPM here, we'll fill it, and then our, you know, we're only, we don't want to see much more than, you know, so maybe we'll go to 40 PSI. So, obviously, all, all right here is our high RPM stuff. So, we kind of, you got to make a pass with your cooling system and your water pump and your position of your of your uh, coolant pressure sensor figure out what normal is okay but 40 psi is probably never going to be normal so let's go ahead and just make 15 degrees out of that so we'll do negative 15 and then maybe you know normal is is 19 and if it starts to lift the head so maybe at 24 and maybe over 3500 rpm so it gets any time going on the track we want to start yanking timing out and I'll we'll start yanking timing it as it gets more. Or maybe you just say, hey, if this thing goes at, at any much, any bit over 29 PSI of cooling pressure, you could even do negative 25, take 25 degrees out. Okay. However you see fit to do it, you can do it. Again, there's no rules in any of this. You decide. Minus 25. So now we, we'll yank timing out uh, of this thing. But sometimes it might just, you might get a little spike in pressure. You might want to pull some timing out. It'll 
maybe sometimes put the head back down maybe or or whatever but however you want to set that safety up you can do that and this will like if you lift the head um and it starts yank timing out a lot of times there's already a problem that the head gaskets already needs to be replaced but if you catch it when it just starts to happen instead of it melting down everything it's just a head gasket instead of a set of pistons and a melted head again we're trying to uh mitigate or, or reduce our chance of, of major issues or try to not try to reduce the damage that we're having. Flip side of that is so many sensors, so many safeties, you know, you have one sensor bug out, you could lose an important race over something stupid. So I kind of really just try to do the, I try not to over safety uh, my car, you know, meaning I have a safety on everything because um, I don't want to lose races over stupid shit. So what I'll do is I'll pretty much only put safeties on the important stuff, fuel pressure, oil pressure, and make sure those sensors are working. Um, so that's a big long spiel there. Does any, are there any questions? Uh, flex. <clears throat> yeah, we had, uh, had one on the bump button, which we right. did. I think we covered that last time pretty good, but. If you just want to revisit that real quick, right. where is the bump, the bump button? So the way I use the bump button, and I got a screen share again. And I, there's many, multiple ways of doing the bump button. Okay, the easiest way to do it is use your basic I/O. Go to the staging feature. And enable it okay now what this does is it puts in your pin map staging one and staging two staging one being your trans brake button so you pin it to your trans brake button and then staging two is going to be your uh your bump button i also use the i also tag my my scramble button to my butt button so it uses two things it's when i'm not on the trans brake it's a scramble button and then uh when i am on the trans brake it's my staging or, or my it's my bump button so it's Two features, one input, so it's pretty cool. The way I use it, I use single pulse, and I just give it a time. And the longer you make it, the harder it bumps. The shorter you make it, the uh, the softer it bumps. And what this is, you tap it, it, it pulses 0.44 seconds to the trans brake. You could also do duty cycle, where it gives you that same time. And this is where you could really fine-tune it in, where it just kind of rolls in. The issue that I... I know that right around 0.05 seconds, plus or minus uh, 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 0.01 seconds, gets me really close. And most people, it's really easy for people to adjust on the fly. So if it, if you turn your your your, RP, your two step RPM up and it bumps too hard, you can easily go in here and uh, and turn this down. This takes some more time at setting it up, but it actually ends up being a, a I guess a better stage. Um, but you have to put your car on the trans brake and really dial it in. And it takes, you know, you build up a lot of heat and, and it, it takes a, a good while. And I try not to do that to people's transmission. So I set most people up with single pulse and you tap the button and you just go up and down to make it harder or softer. Now you cannot use this feature and there's some ways of doing it through the IOs. And then you could even put it as an X or a Y axis based off of trans temp or, or RPM. So you could make an offset the stage of the car based off of, Hey, when I make it, uh, make the duty cycle 80% when I'm 4,400 RPM, but when I'm 3,500 RPM, make it 75. And again, that takes a lot of time to dial that in. Um, I tell guys to use this feature because it's a real quick and easy adjustment. Uh, I also try to get guys to ride their brakes when they're bumping in. So it doesn't get the chassis all Willy wonkus and bouncing all around. Um, and you know, because that's another thing that could cause an issue if you if you bump in too hard that your chassis could be on a downstroke or an upstroke and that could if the light goes green when it's on its way down or versus the light going green on its way up it could affect the way the car leaves so it's a good i i ride my brakes bumping in but this is how i i do it for most guys because it's quick and easy and takes less time of putting your your car on the trans brake now um there's multiple different ways to do it there's plenty of write-ups out there uh this is i find to be the easiest Okay. All right. Uh, and I think there was a question on uh, flex fuel sensor. Talking about a flex fuel tune. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Did I miss any other one? Other questions or no? Yeah, we we gotta keep going. Okay. We're going in order. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's the next one. All right. Cool. So I'll go through a, a quick flex fuel tune. Let me screen share. I got fucking. I'm, I'm gonna get this by the end of this one because that's all I. That's my last shot at it. All right. Here's a file open. So flex fuel sensor. Um, the best place to put it is not in the return. Okay. So the problem with putting your flex fuel sensor in the return is that when you start taxing your fuel system, the way a regulator works, there's a spring and a ball in there, and it opens and shuts based off of pretty much fuel demand. So if you start to tax your fuel system, meaning you're using all the fuel that that fuel could hold, or if you get close to that, that ball stays pretty much closed in the fuel pressure regulator, which means there's no flow in your return line, which means your flex fuel sensor sees 0% flex or ethanol content, which means it doesn't add the fuel that it requires and could be uh, can wreak havoc on your tune. So you actually want to put it on the feed side. Um, pretty important to put it on the feed side. Uh, motion sells like a nice little adapter that splits off. So some sees the uh, flex fuel sensor and some doesn't uh, goes around it. So it doesn't restrict your feed line uh, because the flex fuel sensor is only three eighths uh, fitting. You could also put it, uh, which really wouldn't affect it much as far as starving your, your injectors. If you put it on the line that goes from your fuel rails back to your fuel pressure regular, or even one of them, that's okay without having to buy an adapter. Uh, it just needs to be on the pressure side of the regulator, not on the return side. All right. Um, pretty important. I've done it the wrong way before years ago, and I learned the hard way. I'm like, what the hell is this thing doing? Oh, I'm taxing the fuel system. I should probably finish what I was doing here. Taxing the fuel system, and the thing was going rich to lean, rich to lean, rich to lean. So, all right. All right, so here's a tune. All right. So we'll set up a flex fuel. So the first thing that we need to do with, with a flex fuel tune is going to be we need to turn on the actual flex fuel multiplier. So you can name the table. This one's named, uh, called flex fuel. Uh, you could also just do call it like multi or whatever. This is what it's going to show up in your data log. So however you name it, make sure you know what it is. We're going to call it a fuel flow multiplier, not a fuel flow offset. Not an enrichment offset, but a fuel flow multiplier, which means it's going to multiply how much fuel it's calling for based on what that ethanol content sensor. And then uh, we are, do I have flex fuel sensor on this tune? I do not. So let's add a flex fuel sensor. Oh, it's there. Flex fuel. I'll just turn it on. There we go. Go back to that 1D table. And we're going to do it off flex fuel. All right. So... Zero to 100 percent right here at the bottom, and then knowing what we know that 885 is roughly 33 percent more fuel. I usually give it a 39 percent at fuel at full flow, at 100 percent ethanol, and clear it. So then when you're at about 85, which is between these two, we're right at 33 percent, pretty much 32, 33. And then once you get a good pump gas tune dialed in and your and your fuel corrections are within a few percent, you could go up and down with this whole table to dial it in. So your fuel correction is the same on the ethanol uh, as it is when after you have a good dialed in fuel map. That way you don't have to change much. Um, you don't have to tune the whole fuel map again because there is some, uh, you know, depending on the wiring, resistance in the wiring, the flex fuel sensor, there, there is sometimes a little bit. They might be off a few percent based on what it really is. But it's not enough where it's, uh, you know, you just dial this table in a little bit and you're good. Now, so so some people would stop there and be like, okay, so I got my ethanol content sensor. When you go in your fuel tab, it what it does is a blanket multiplier on all your fuel after all your corrections are made. So if it's you're at 80, if you're at 85 percent and it adds 33 percent, it'll add 33 percent startup fuel, add 33 percent to all your enrichment calculations, it'll add 33 percent to your base fuel table off the rip. And then you're just good. You don't have to go in and mess around with this. And then if you do 50, 
E50 or half ethanol, it's going to do 15 and a half percent and and so on and so forth. So it works really well. You don't have to do two field, two whole two field tunes. You just dial that table in a little bit and you're good. But now sometimes there's more to it than just that. You know, we, we don't want to run too much boost based on our, our ethanol. So if we're on pump gas, you know, after we get everything dialed in and how much pressure we know it takes, we'll do a 10 PSI offset. On, like say this is a 20 PSI tune and we're good on 10, 10 pounds of boost. We'll take t all 10 pounds out and be pump gas. We're good for, for a 93 for 10 pounds of boost. And we make 20 pounds of boost on, on ethanol, full ethanol. We'll take 10 out. And then maybe as the ethanol comes in, we'll start putting boost back in or taking less out. So when it's, when it's over 60% ethanol, we'll allow the car to have full boost. Now, a couple other things pop up. So, okay, so we adjust the boost. Maybe the timing. Maybe we we're kind of we're gonna really stretch the boost on pump gas. Uh, maybe we'll do a flex timing offset. So again, we got our flex fuel. We got our map sensor here, and if we go up here to toolbox, we could change our map sensor display in PSI because we're American and we all understand that a little bit easier. That as it, you know, maybe we want to neuter it a little bit, make it extra safe. We don't have a real good tune up on, on pump gas, but we want to make sure this person doesn't blow their stuff up. So we'll start ganking timing out here. Okay. As, and as the ethanol content comes up, we pull in less and less timing. And in this particular table, if you're over 60%, we don't pull timing. So now based off that flex fuel sensor, we, we turn the boost up and down. We, Fix the ignition timing so it's not too much. And again, we're at this point, we're not pulling any timing or doing anything for cruising or drivability because we still want that, that timing to be the same as our normal timing, only affecting it under boost and what boost pressure that we wanted to. But we fixed our, our boost control. We also uh, fixed our fueling. Uh, and then we fixed our timing. Now, one thing that, that might happen is that if you have a, like, you know, like you're using the China Boy waste gates and that sticks closed. So everything's all hunky dory except for we have no actual boost cut. So one thing that I do is I do a, what I call a floating boost cut based off of ethanol content. And I use it doing a dwell time offset, which means if we pull all the dwell out, if you have LS coils and they're three and a half milliseconds of dwell is what it takes them. If we pull five out based on our ethanol content, if your wastegate sticks that this particular tune, it'll pull, it'll shut the, it'll, do a cut at 13 psi and then if it's over 27 percent ethanol it'll allow it to have 15 psi if it's over 40 it allows it to have 22 psi if it's over 60 we then go back to our main boost cut so this this ethanol content center there's a true flex fuel pull up to the gas pump put a e85 in it put pump gas in it put a mixture of it and once this is all dialed in and making sense the car just turns itself up and down and that way you know you could send that car out and tell this person that you could race a honda with a fart cannon on it, no matter you're on pump gas or 85, race your heart away. Okay. Um, this is all done through the advanced tuning sections and anything else that you could think of. There's nothing, there's, there's an offset or anything you could do. There's no rules again, do however you want to do it, but that's how I do a flex fuel tune. So when you come in and you're like, and I'm usually like, Hey, do you have a flex fuel sensor? And you're like, no. And I'm like, you really should just put a flex fuel sensor on it. Cause Hey, it's just, it, we could do so much cool stuff with it. And then B, uh, when you go to pickle your fuel system, you could just pour 93 in it and go drive the car around or, you don't, you know, anytime you store a car at the 85 and you come back to clogged injectors. So this is a, a uh, for the 150 bucks, so like, like what the sensor and the little harness and all the stuff that you need to run it cost. I think it's a no brainer, even if it's a straight up race car. If you're running pump 85, it also keeps everything in check for you. Um, all good on that one. And one other, is there any other questions? Can you share some experience with active speed management? Yeah, I absolutely can. So, actually, here is my car. So, active speed management is kind of like following the dots. Um, it takes time to get it dialed in, and you need to have a good pass. It just doesn't, you don't just click on traction control or whatever, and it works. Now, you could do it off of two ways you could do it off crankshaft rotation or the uh, preferred way is dry shaft. So on this one, what you do is you get a really good pass in, uh, and then you import your log file. And what it'll do is it'll map your your dry shaft curve in it. And it goes by time here, okay? 
So when you let off the trans brake button, a perfect pass is going to follow that same dry shaft curve. Now I'll get like, you'll usually see it do some wonky stuff on the shift. So I smoothed all that out. So you don't see it. Um, and then you have three forms of, uh, of pulling power. We'll call it. Okay. We have our base, which is our, which is the dry shaft to a fast pass. Okay. And then you have your retard a, you have your retard B and then your rev limit. Okay. Uh, retard A is going to mean if your dry shaft spikes and it comes up to this second line right here, it's going to pull this amount of timing here. I have retard A to set six degrees on my particular car. All right. So if it passes that, it starts to, it, it, it'll average it out. If it starts to go towards the retard B, I have it pulling another, we go to here to our retard B. I have a point 13 degrees. So it'll pull six on the first shot. And if it starts to creep towards retard B, it'll start averaging out to pull another 13 degrees. So if it's halfway there, it'll pull that six plus another six. And if it gets to this point, it's pulling a lot of timing. And if it still keeps going, like you're racing on ice and it doesn't stop it, it'll hit a rev limiter. And if you hear a car like uh, going down the track and it's like, uh, uh, it almost sounds like it's breaking up or it's popping off the rev limiter, a lot of times this is this is what it's riding. Um, you have to figure out how tight you want this. And if you problem is if you get it too tight here in the, in the first uh, like second, half a second, is that, you know, 10% difference between all those could really kill you. You also, depending if you're running a radial or a slick or your surface, uh, this is where a G sensor kind of comes into play is that you got to figure out how much slip are you going to allow it to have where it's still making forward momentum because there is time where the, the tire is spinning, but you're still pulling and you're still going. If we saw that first round, uh, the first two races, you'll see that that one car, uh, that, that, that black Camaro left a black mark all the way down the track, but it was going fast as hell. Or it looked like a fast as hell pass. But that, that was fast as hell for the first pass. And it and it left the darkest black mark <laughs> the whole eighth mile. And but there was so much forward momentum on that. So that tire was spinning, but that car was still going. If you yeah, no, had your curve so tight that when it slipped any type of like slip, that car would have just made a slow little driving down the 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 track. The thing about yeah. trash control, uh or the active speed management is you need to have a working car, good tune-ups and your car figured out before you go ahead and apply this. If you do not have your car figured out, don't even bother clicking and turning this on. Just don't because you need to have a good dry shaft curve and a handle on your chassis. And, and you cannot rely on this to make your car go fast because if it's hitting these lines, the car is going slow. If you're pulling power, the car is going slow. So if you don't have your suspension set up or your chassis set up for your car to go down, go down a shitty surface or whatever the surface that you're racing, by turning this on, yes, it will go down that road, but it'll just go down slow and you're going to lose anyway. So don't even bother spending the 500 bucks on this. Don't even bother turning it on until you have a car that works. And once you have a car that works, now we could salvage a pass that would normally would have been, uh, been aborted because this is what it's going to do for you. If you're pulling power, you're going slow. There's just no way around it. Like there's no magic traction control that you just turn the car up to 40 pounds of boost, let off the butt and let it eat. That just, it just doesn't work like that. You still have to be able to read the surface, know how much the power that surface could take. Okay. Because if you're pulling all the power, the car is just going to go slow. And that's really just my opinion on that. I don't, I mean, it, it makes, I, I feel like that's just right, but there might be people that tell me I'm stupid and that's fine too. There's more than one way to do things. So, um, as far as uh, traction control in an advanced section, uh, the cool thing about X3 that just came out, they actually give you a pretty cool wheel slip uh, traction control, which guys were doing before uh, in the advanced section of the advanced tables, meaning you'd put a front wheel speed sensor on the car uh, and a rear wheel or a dry shaft sensor or rear wheel speed, and you compare those two. And if one goes fast, if your rear goes faster than your front, you can set a timing offset to pull power. Uh, the new X3 software, and the cool thing is it's a free um, add-on. You don't have to buy the, the add-on like you do with the, the active speed management. Uh, they have it built in for you, so you could just answer some questions and, and get going on it. I have not tried it out yet, so I don't want to sit there and talk shit like 
Um, I just looked at X3 today, like just like everybody else, except for some of the beta testers. Um, but if we go into here, add individual configuration. Now, Terminator X actually has traction control option, period. It didn't even have an option for traction control before, but now it does, which is pretty cool. So you could use the 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 slew of uh, Davis products, which a lot of people have a lot of su success with them. Um, they added this wheel slip, which I thought was really cool. Um, you have to obviously you have to have an, a front speed sensor, which this tune doesn't, and then a uh, an undriven with, with a driven speed would be your drive shaft speed or your rear, a rear wheel speed sensor, um, and then undriven would be like a front wheel speed sensor. Okay. That's how they, they call it. So you'd set those up. Um, and then here is, uh, you would set up your speed by like, your, like maybe it's a, uh, a hundred miles an hour. We'll, we'll do the table. So it's the same, the same. All right. So if we go up, to, we, we run up to a hundred miles an hour and then this is how much slip that it detects based off those two. And you say, Hey, if I see a hundred percent slip at under 20 miles an hour, the front, we could pull 20 degrees of timing. And then it pulls 20 and then you could then depending on how how aggressive you want to get it and this is going to take some dialing in again but you they used to ever a lot of guys did this through the advanced tables uh but now they just give you an easier way to do it and you could tell it hey only only pull four, 11 degrees or 12 degrees or or it'll also show you what how much timing you're going to end up at that point too which is kind of cool um and then you also tell it here how fast do you want to uh, add timing or take away timing or how fast you want it to, to let me rephrase it how fast you want it to remove it and then put it back you know uh, and that is a a percent by second so it's a pretty instant thing but if it if you wanted to take the timing out put it back real fast you're going to increase these numbers uh, if you want it to be a little slower more smoother um, you want to uh, you would decrease these numbers you know so it takes less to, to bring it in and out um, and then you could also do a cylinder cut where this starts pulling, uh, depending on if it gets the slip gets real bad, it starts cutting out cylinders or puts it on a rev limiter. Uh, this is new and this is actually really cool. Now, let's take this a step further. If you have a car that pulls the wheels, for the wheel slip calculation does not do much for you. Okay. Especially if your front tires are bouncing off the ground. Some of the, the, the hater bars or the extendo shocks, or the, you know, like the, where the front is kind of bouncing off the air, you know, that would really mess this up. So this would be used in a, uh, a situation where uh, it's a very, very, very shit surface, you know, uh, back of the track, virgin asphalt, things like that. If the car pulls the wheels at any time going down the track or even the beginning. Now, if it pulls the wheels just for the first, like, you know, half a second or something like that, you could tell it when you want it to start reading, like, like, hey, don't go, don't work till I'm over 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. You could do that. That's where on a, like a drag application where the active speed management kind of comes into being handy because if the car bounces the front tires going down the track, which we see a lot of cars do that, or if, or if it pulls the wheels, we're only, we are only uh, referencing dry shaft speed off of our, our, pretty much our acceleration rate is what it is. So if your acceleration on the drive shaft spikes up real high, we know that spin, but the front wheels have nothing to do with it. You could also use both. You could use active speed management on this and you could use wheel slip. There's nothing saying that you can't do both. You could uh, use active speed management. And then, but sometimes what you'll do is that you use your active speed management for the first, uh, say, uh, one and a half seconds of the run and then switch it over to wheel slip. You could do that too. Whatever works best for you. There's, there's uh, the thing about trash control or a lot of this stuff that we're going over. There's no one fits all. Uh, you have to work, figure out what works for your chassis uh, or or your car in particular. You know, um, your combo. What works for you? Uh, there's not really a cut and paste tune that we just dump into everybody's car that works this stuff. And I and I still like you go out, you test, and you figure it out. You know, that's just that's just what winners do. We don't we just keep trying, right? So. Um, Hopefully that answers your questions about um, about the, the some of the active speed management and, and traction control stuff. All right. Um, Next one was uh, can he go back over boost builder section? Yeah. So if you have a a, a dominator HP, you guys am I in the right? 
All right. Okay. We're in there. All right. So I use for all the boost building, unless you've got a, a dump valve or a super duper loose converter, I use an advanced table for boost builder. And I'll sh first I'll show you Holly's boost builder function. So let me screen share. Screen share window. All right. So Holly, if you go to the, the boost control function, if you have this, if you have an HP or dominator only, okay, you'll see it's got a boost builder function. Also note that if you turn this on and you don't have this trans brake launch enable, it just goes off TPS and this could really screw you up just going down the road. I've had, I had that happen to a guy um, where his fixed timing was pretty high. They, they didn't even realize this was occupied because the base tune he used had it clicked or something like that. And he'd make a full throttle pull. And for some reason, this was at like 35 degrees and the thing would be, it would go in an open loop uh, and it would uh, be in 35 degrees timing, no matter what, what he did. And that's one thing when you guys are looking at dialogue and you're trying to figure out what the hell's going on. The first thing I always look at is if say someone said something's, something's doing something funny. I see if the, if it goes into open loop versus closed loop. If the ECU goes into open loop and you know, your closed loop print and you don't tell it to, that means it's hitting some sort of function, whether it's a boost builder function. Uh, and a lot of times it could be a rev limiter of some sort uh, that is starting to hit. So that's one way to look at it. Um, uh, or if there's an error in it and it might be going with things to startup mode. So uh, if it goes in the open loop without you commanding it, that usually tells you somewhere in your tune that you've got a function being activated for whatever reason. Okay. But so anyway, so this is Holly's boost builder function. You click it, click the trans brake enable, you drag it up to it. Uh, this says, hey, anything over 51% throttle, over three pounds of boost, but under 12 pounds of boost, fix the timing at seven degrees. Now, this is on my car. I use this function, okay? And the reason why I use this function is because I have an internal and external dump valve. So my car gets on, I don't have any issues building boost. I have no issues getting it on the two step. So I could just lock the timing real low and it'll build whatever boost I want it to. Uh, and you know, what I do is I adjust this number and my, and my target boost number to be how much boost I want to make. If I increase this number and I hit 12 pounds, it'll put the timing back in the car. Usually won't make more than 12 pounds. If I want, if I want to make 13 pounds, I would increase this number. I'd go back to my boost builder function. I would increase this number also. Now, if you do not have internal dump valves or a really loose converter and you have trouble getting the thing up on the trans brake, that's, where I think a lot of us have an issue. We can't really start to use a boost builder function until we get to the two step. Um, and what that does is we need to be able to get the engine enough power to get to the two step. Uh, let me go back to. Right. Go back to the other one. So not everybody's got dump valves and all that stuff. So we'll go to this the advanced section. We'll build a 1D table. And this is how I do it. Some guys do a 2D table. You can do it however the hell you want. Just showing you how I do it. So we'll just call it, we'll name the table Boost Builder. Okay. And we'll do a timing offset. So generally, it's timing that, that does the most. Unless if your fuel map's in, in pretty good shape, you really shouldn't have to do much for a fuel offset where you have to dump fuel into the pipes. Uh, if your fuel map's not really tuned up there or... Uh, if you, if the timing doesn't get it done, sometimes you, you might want to do a fuel a flow modifier to start throwing some fuel in the pipe to get it to light. But I usually timing, I say 90% of the time gets it done. Okay. So we do a timing offset and then I do it over by boost. Okay, you can do it by map, but I do it by boost. I enable it when my trans brake button is. So it could be rev limiter one or staging input one, whatever is pinned to your trans brake input use staging input one because i always know that's trans brake okay you could also add a secondary like maybe you want to do it when your trans brakes on and your throttle position is over 50 percent. i don't know if that's super necessary to do i don't do it like this because i normally put some timing into it down low like say we got like 10 we'll throw 10 degrees of timing in it uh we also have to scale it don't forget to scale so we could have some issues there so we'll scale it to say 20 pounds of boost here fill it in so maybe we'll throw 10 degrees of timing at this thing because the converter is pretty tight. 
to try to get it to the two step. Okay, so we'll throw it at, at, at anything under 1.3 psi. We'll throw 10 degrees of timing at it. The reason why I kind of I I know it's working because you'll hear the engine rev up a little bit when you hit the trans brake button. Once it revs up, you know, okay, it's in my boost builder function. I did something right. And then what we'll do is that maybe we want to make, say, 10 pounds of boost. So we'll go to here to 10 pounds, and uh, we start by pulling timing. Now, here's one thing. You need to, when the weather changes, this changes. Uh, when it's nice and cool outside, the cars will usually get up and build boost no problem. When it gets hot and muggy and shitty outside and the air starts to turn, you might need to start adjusting how much timing you're pulling and pull less or pull more. So maybe we'll knock 10 degrees out of it. Now this is pulling timing and then we'll smooth it in. So what this does for you is that it throws the timing at it and, and, and this can take some tuning. So we got to figure out what, you know, how much, how long it takes to get to the two step. This will sometimes like adding the timing will, will, will make it take less time to get to the two step. And once it gets on the two step, we want to start gradually pulling the timing out. If we just dump the timing out on one shot, like, like how it is on mine and, Sometimes the RPM will drop too much and it'll fall out of the two step and then it doesn't want to build boost either or it just leaves like a dog. So we'll throw some timing in it and then we'll slowly pull the timing out till it gets to maybe five pounds of boost. Now we got enough. Now that the engine's at five pounds of boost, has got enough power to keep it on the two step. And now we can start yanking timing out like pretty crazy uh, to get this thing uh, pulling timing out to uh, build some boost. And then what we'll do is that how long that you pull the timing out is where you're going to sometimes this and how much target pressure is on your on your trans brake and your boost bar is going to affect how much boost it makes um but i can tell you it, in my program the dump valve inside my transmission it was a game changer also the dump valve could be used for power management as well um so that's one thing to, to keep in mind but I don't use this table in my particular tune because i got the dump valve so it goes right to the two-step and builds boost so i uh I yank all the timing out of it uh, with the dump valves open. And then I also stage the dump valves uh, closing going down the track to help uh, loosen the converter or tighten the converter. Now, sometimes guys, converters are just too tight or their engine doesn't have enough ass. If you've got a, uh, a big 94 millimeter turbo and you put on a four eight and the rings are wasted in it, and you're trying to build like sometimes you're in your your converter since the thing only makes 200 horsepower so then you put a converter that you got at a swap meet out of a big block uh you know sometimes your combo just won't build boost and you have to make a converter change and converter is going to be where all, a lot of your voodoo in this is done um this will a proper converter with an engine that can operate in the rpm band that, that is meant to uh, you usually don't have to play around with this a lot, but sometimes we've got a small engine, uh, not a whole lot of compression in it, and sometimes we got to help it a little bit. But this isn't if your car won't, if you're if you put your trans uh, boost control on, everything's right, and you get get on the trans brake and it only gets a three thousand RPM, throwing ten degrees at it might get you to thirty five hundred, but but it's not going to get you to forty five hundred. Okay, so. Uh, you can't, if your combo is bad, you just need to fix it. But this is some ways that we could help it, right? So uh, any other questions on the boost builder before I move on? Okay. Don't see any. <clears throat> if, uh, if you update to the new V6 uh, and you're on 200, I believe, you will not lose any of your tunes. In fact, you can update even V4 and V5 tunes up to V6. You just uh, you just open them in V6, and then it asks you to update them. The, you, I have run into issues before. If you if you try to like go from a four to six, I try to I open the four and a five, and then the five and the six. But if you do that too much, you could corrupt the tune. I've had that happen where it'll just do weird wonky things. So it's good practice when you update, you know, from a four to six or five to six. That you kind of just look through your tune and make sure nothing changed. Um, you know, and, and it's not so much a Holly issue. It's just like a windows issue. They like some, some people's computers freak, freak shit out and some don't, I don't know what the end, I don't know why or how, but, uh, but yeah, you could open up uh, as, uh, a, a version four version five tune and version six or any early version six tunes and it'll, it'll up convert it. And once you save it again, it, it's all, you're all good.
what would I have? What would we have to do, Tony? Is there a, is there a part two? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Prioritize input for wheel speed input. So using the IO box at, at 100 hertz, uh, so far I haven't really had any issues with it being too slow on wheel speed sensors. Um, but that being said, the fastest, best way is to have the inputs directly into the ECU and not through the box. Um, you know, part of that is, you know, also the, the, the logging rate, but how many tooth count do you have? A lot of guys will put uh, a Hall effect sensor to pick up one of the, the lugs and I, that'll give you, you know, one pulse per rev or five pulse per revolution for a five lug. Um, some people don't think that's fast enough. I think it's fast enough. Uh, you have to play with it and see what it does, you know, but I think the biggest ticket or the biggest trick is making sure that the rear and the front read the same accurate uh, accuracy. Like if, if they're both kind of slow, they, sometimes it's not as bad, but if one's faster or, or, and one slower, or one like doesn't have as much of the same re refresh rate, it'll send it really wonky. If that makes any sense. Um, you know, we have to, at one point realize like, yes, the Terminator X is very capable. Yes. That IO box adds a lot of capability to it, but there's a point in time where we just need to buy a dominator <laughs> like, because it's 43 inputs and 36 outputs and they're not limited. They're not slow. There's no uh, can cable connection possibility having an issue at any point. They just work. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, you pick what's most important. You know, and I would put wheel speed sensors uh, in the ECU directly versus the IO box if at all possible. Uh, but I have not. I've had people with the uh, at a, with with it in the IO box, and it seemed to work okay. Nothing that was like, oh, it's definitely an issue. You know. Next, uh, well, Scott, we're going to come back to your question because we're already kind of here on this topic. What are your down track dump valve strategies? So, um, I still, I don't, in my, and I use it in my personal car. Um, well, I'm just going to trade it so I can. All right. So, screen share. So, Holly has like a, a racing. So, I'll go over what Holly's tools are. And I set my, my dump valves up before Holly gave us this, so mine's a little different. I'll show you both. So you go to add con individual configuration, go to transmission, and then you can go to racing transmission, and it kind of gives you a, a, a output. So if you have a turbo 400, it's a three-speed. If you have a power glide, it's a two It's a two-speed. Uh, if you've got an air shifter, here's some ways of, it, of, it, of setting up your air shift. What RPM do you want it? How long do you want the air shifter on? This is all stuff that could have been done or has been done for years. They just give you like a questionnaire to answer to make it easier for you. But again, it's not necessary to do it this way. Um, they also give you converter lockup strategies, uh, spool assist, which would be like an, a, a dump valve assist or just dump valves in general. So uh, you could do dump valve one, dump valve two. Uh, you can start answering the questions when you want it on, how long do you want it on for, do you want a, a pause? Kind of like the nitrous control, very similar. Okay. This is one way that you could do dump valves. Okay. Now, the way I have mine are, I have them just set up in an output. And we'll go to an external internal dump. It's a grounding output. And I use a solid state relay. I use solid state relays because they're instant. There's no time and they fail a lot less. Um, and that's the pin that I have them on. So my external dump. So internal dumps make the most change. Internal dump is where it pulls the charge pressure from the converter right off the valve body um, and dumps it back in. Those ones usually will knock five to 800 RPM a stall out of your torque converter. And then the external dump is where it, it bypasses the charge pressure at your cooler line. That's the most common, cheapest one that guys run. I find, that, and it depends on the torque converter and it depends on the trans, it, it, it's only usually a couple hundred RPM. So... Um, you'll see my internal dump it does the most, does more than it does most of it. So I have it. So, Hey, when it's on my trans break and my boost time is below, uh, 5.6 seconds, uh, it's on. Okay. Which means the reason why I did it like this is so when I'm driving around, uh, 
it's not on. Okay, so the timer's on for 5.6 seconds. So if I hit the throttle and it starts my boost time or whatever it is, what pretty much when I'm cruising, my my dump my internal dump valve isn't on. Now, if I was in this particular case, the track was good, converter's good. I, I not, I'm not using it for power management. My internal dump, pretty simple. Well, that was my internal, that my, my external dump. I'm sorry, I'm getting lost in my own shit. My external dump, I just have it on with my trans brake. That's it. So I just use it for staging. Now, when I go to the track, depending on what I'm doing, uh, say if the track starts to get a little, gets a little slick or, you know, uh, my converter was a little tight for my combo. So what I would do is I look at my dialogs. I know that at, at uh, I'll switch this to an or. So it's, it's on when my trans brake is on or my boost time is below, say, maybe 2.6 seconds. 2.6 seconds, I know in my car is pretty much uh, is when it's shifting. So I, what I'm doing in this situation is that I'm leaving my dump valve on, let my converter be loose all of first gear. So now that I've got all the wheel speed and everything's good, I hit second gear at 2.2 second and it closes. Now, the dump valves, they don't, it's not like it just closes and all of a sudden you it, it adds another 500 RPM or it ties up the converter 500 RPM. It actually takes a little bit of time. Um, and we're talking, you know, uh, tenths of seconds here but it'll actually kind of it closes the fluid starts to fill the converter up so it's a nice actual smooth transition it's not like a hard boom where you're going to knock the tires off as soon as you close it uh, uh so sometimes i'll do that sometimes i'll only depending on the track conditions I'll, I'll keep that dump valve on for the first half a second or right through the 60 foot to allow it to carry to kind of soften that blow a little bit because sometimes if the converter is too tight and applies the power too soon, it knocks the tires off. So this is one way to control like your your slip uh, of your torque converter. Now, if you run like some of those higher end transmissions, they'll actually have multiple stages of dumps. And the way that works is that there's a, a, a restriction. So each dump, you know, is bypassing a different amount of charge pressure or a different amount of pressure to the torque converter. And in that case, you could either do dump one, dump two, dump three, and you could set it as a timer. Uh, guys are using the nitrous controller before Holly gave you the racing trans, or you could use the racing trans, and then you would have your dump valves, and this is where you'd have maybe four stages of dump, and you could then stage them going down the track. And this is how you really dial in. Uh, and this, these are like those like really expensive, uh, like M&M &M or, or, or Rosler transmissions with the, you'll see a bunch of, you know, pretty much dump valves on the side of the transmission. That's what this is for right here. So the strategy I use in mine is, is a pretty simple one. Like most, most everyone has with a power glide or 400, you know, or that huge dual stage. I have an internal external dump. I use my internal dump to, to manage power or to uh, loosen up the converter for an X amount of time going down the track. And that'll help it, uh, you know, you know, give it a looser converter to help absorb some of that power through the first 60 foot and then maybe start allowing it to apply or get rid of some of the slippage when you get into high gear if that makes any sense so hopefully that answers your question um what else we got our next one's completely different so that's why i skipped over it because this is the getting my tune file to upload to my holly 750 double pumper <laughs> You got to buy an e uh, EFI, bud. <laughs> You're not going to get a tune file on that thing. You need a screwdriver and a little cup to drain the fuel. That's what you got to do. Learn about your bleeds, too. Um, so, uh, is V3 going to last? So, there's going to be uh, probably never be able to use an NTK sensor with a, with a Terminator X based on the, the, the O2 driver internal. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's going to happen. You'd have to have a, a dominator to do that. Oh, excuse me. That being said, the Bosch 4.9 O2 sensor is a pretty damn good O2 sensor. It's, it's good enough being used in OEM uh, Fords, some Toyotas, and some other uh, OEM cars. They're not bad at all. You just It's really important to put them in the right spot and make sure they don't get water on them. And so, so, so that, that's all my spiel on the, on the advanced stuff. Um, you know, I wanted to point out because there's always like everyone's always comparing ECUs and stuff like that. Um, Holly is one of the only 
the only ones that I know of that they actually give you the option of making these advanced features. I know AEM was doing it. Um, so I think this is kind of what breeds breeds innovation of, of figuring things out and, and using some ideas that you may have. Um, actually, on that, I, I, I guess I, I go over another good idea, um, I guess, before I, I get kicked off of here. Um, that, you know, with V6, Holly was actually um, – allowed you gave us a rev limit offset options. Now this is not an option on Terminator X and I kind of wish it was because it could, we could really use, do some cool things. So if you look at some of like the higher, higher end, like a MoTeC ECU and look at their traction control or, or their launch control, they'll actually, um, their launch control is, is not just a flat, you know, you get on the boost, it's on a rev limiter, but when you let off the button, it kind of varies the, the a rev limiter off it kind of steps it out of a rev limiter to help give it some traction and then then pretty much hands it off to the trash control uh we have the ability of doing that so one way like on a stick car uh it was probably the, the best way of using this um would be a, like a rev limit offset so you get it on the on the two-step and you're, you're popping and banging like real crazy like um maybe we want to do we want to let off that clutch, but we don't want to apply all that power right away. So one thing that we can do, um, we can enable this table. We'll call it a rev offset. All right. And we'll go, we'll set a timer. So maybe it'll be our, uh, any other timer. We're going to call it a rev limit, main rev limit offset. Okay. And then we'll go off of... This is, we'll just do boost time. So this because it's an easy way of doing it. Now, main rev limiter in this particular tune uh, is 8,400 RPM. Okay. So, and this is like the high and the low. So this is the range of it. So maybe if we're going to do this, we're going to just do spark only and, and have a real hard rev limit, which you could do. No big deal. You could do it however you like. Go back to that 2D table here. Probably giving all my, my fucking secrets now away. I haven't played a lot with this idea, and this is something I, I've been wanting to, so don't, like, crucify me at all. But uh, we did a car with, with MoTeC, and this is kind of how MoTeC's strategy was on their launch control, and I was like, the, the gears start turning, you know. So maybe, you know, our, our, our rev limiter in this, this particular one, our two-step is set at 4,000 RPM. So for, we have to do a little bit of math. So 4,800. So if we want to be at 4,000, that'd be a 4,400 RPM uh difference right so maybe we would go we're gonna say okay slowly let off that rev limiter and let's not let's do it over say one second so this is like instantaneous okay so we let off that trans brake button and we're gonna do a four thousand rpm offset and maybe we'll smooth it all in so what this is going to do is that when we let off our our, our clutch, our trans brake button, or, or whatever it is, let me shut that off. You let off you let off that the timer starts, and it's going to go for the first right off the first second. It's going to only increase the rev limit. It's going to bounce off the rev limit. And it's going to slowly over a second, kind of very off the rev limit. So it's going to go ah, and go. And what this is another way is managing some power uh, in a, maybe a blower car or uh, some sort of a, a car that hits the tires really hard. So as you as the clutch is fully out, this is going to allow it to kind of ride a rev limit uh, off of the uh, off the clutch, if that makes any sense. Um, this is another way it would be similar to like, kind of like slipping your clutch. You know what I mean? It, it's applying, allowing it to apply gradually and again this is over a second so this is almost instant, instantaneous you know but it applies the rpm that it's allowing the engine to have almost like slipping a clutch you know what i mean how you would kind of do a slipping a clutch uh, i haven't played a whole lot with this but this is a strategy or a similar strategy that that some of the higher end ecus or factory ecus with their launch control use to do it um and something i'm gonna something some of you guys might want to try out and play around with and see if it if it works it might not i mean i'm it's, i'm gonna be playing with it here in the next few weeks actually but a little idea I had. You guys are probably gonna tell me it's stupid and it won't work, and that's okay too. But I thought that was a kind of a cool idea. In my head at least. <laughs> so 
Only one way to find out, though. That's right. right. We're yeah. going to try it. And I do have a, a track rental coming up, too, if anybody's interested. That's a little shameless plug. Uh, at Dragway 42, I'll have one lane that they just leave alone. Um, and then we'll do uh, another, like, premium prep, like a radio prep lane on the other side. And we I do my track rentals at night. So they're from, uh, you know, there's usually 10 to 15 cars there. Um, and we have, we'll have the track from like 6 PM to 10 PM. Uh, yeah, so 6 PM to 10 PM, just straight up, you know, the track to ourselves. So we usually get a lot done and you don't have to sweat or take off work. So shoot me what a message. What day is that? It's a uh, Thursday, May 4th. So if you guys want to get some testing in before the Coonley, uh, no prep, you know, we'll have a lane where I just won't let that, they won't touch it. You know, they're not going to scrape or anything like that, but they won't touch it. So what's your uh, dyno schedule looking like? Uh, dyno, we're a couple weeks out. Best best to give us a call and get on the schedule as soon as possible. I usually do an afternoon or morning appointment, afternoon and morning appointments for, for Holly cars. You usually get two done a day. If you pull 4,000 off the brake, wouldn't it just die? So that four thousands off the main rev limit, not the trans, not the two step rev limiter. So the main rev limit is actually at eighty four hundred. So if you take four thousand off eighty four hundred, it would be a forty four hundred RPM rev limit. Uh, yeah, forty four hundred RPM rev limit. Um, but I was going based off of what our two step rev limit. Is it's a switch over? If that makes any sense. So. So it sounds like you're getting put to work at the track rental. Yeah. Now I do. So that track rental is an open invite for anybody who wants to come rent it, rent it. Two seventy five a car. I do offer like track side support. I charge an extra hundred fifty bucks. I usually do three or four cars, so it's limited. But I had to have tuned that car prior. So um, don't come in and be like, "I need your help for one hundred fifty bucks," and it's not a car tune because what usually what ends up happening is that people do things differently. Not wrong. There are so many different ways of, of getting the same end result, and and people have different ways of doing it. And I'm not saying it's wrong or they're stupid or, or they don't know how to tune or anything like that. But what they do may not make sense to me, and what I do may not make sense to them. So if if it's a tune I call I, I, for so the car I tune before, whether remotely or in person, I'm good with it. If it's if you have another tuner, just get a hot spot. <laughs> so and have them come with you you know i'm open i don't care who comes or or, or what other tuners or i don't really you know or, I, just come to the track rental have some fun run your car you know but i had to have tuned the car prior for me to you know to get my track support so one of the things that that i, I got going on for guys so um but uh but cool. Yeah, I got I need to get 10 cars to make it happen. I think we should have it covered. But again, we can have over 10 cars. So. And I and Ron always gives us really good track prep on my rentals. And, and I don't like taking off work. and I don't like sweating in the hot sun. I hate during the day track. rentals. So uh, it's nice to race under the lights, you know. So. Cool, input. <clears throat> cool input. Thanks. How much does Dino service to Dino so, service to cost? Goes based off of time. It's minimum four hundred fifty bucks um, to do a do a Holly car. So everything's working. Everything all set up right. We're not diagnosing a bunch of problems, and we get done in a lot of time. It's usually four fifty. Sometimes if we take a little more time or there's other stuff, it could go more than that. But um, if the car is ironed out and you don't have a, like cooling issues or other problems, and we're literally just tuning the car. We're normally done in a couple hours, so we spend more time diagnosing problems than anything. Ah, uh, all right. There he, he meant this Thursday. He's tuning your fresh build. Yeah, gotcha. I think you got a, a remote remote thing set up. We'll get it started. Oh, that was also it was also a good opportunity to clarify about tuning at the track. Yeah, uh, James. How much? Well. He's trying to he's trying to razz me because he knows how hardcore of a Mopar guy I am and how how <laughs> spot Mopars get under my skin. <laughs> LSs are for Fords and Chevys. Okay, they're not 
They're not for both parts, okay? <laughs> Don't even get me out on a tangent, James. Do it, James. Don't do it. Don't do not do it. Because we'll get into a <laughs> Hemi versus LS, and I'll start, you know. So, but good times. Oh. Nah, not the Fords. Yeah. Especially guys, Fords. Yeah, I'll let you guys fight over it. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave them alone. You guys, you know, we did we did Chrysler swap a Ford. We put a, a Gen 3 Hemi in a Mustang that we run on Drag Week and Sick Week and all that stuff. But <clears throat> I mean, all three platforms are good. They're good. Uh, it's They're just, all shitty, right? They're all just shitty in one way or another. Well, right. Exactly. They all break. None of them last forever. Thus, I, I'm, I'm always grateful that I was brought up as a GM guy because only for the affordability. Yeah. Ford, Ford is catching up on the affordability side of things in the aftermarket. But man, if it's five bucks for a GM part, it's 10 for a Ford and 20 for a Mopar. That is true. Well, I, what I find actually, if you build a really expensive, like exotic engine, whether it's Ford GM, like a billet crank is still 4,500 bucks. They don't care what they're cutting it for, you know, like, right. Set aluminum rods, you know, the, the thing with GM is that you have four or five block options, you know, 10 different head options. But normally, like, when you're buying expensive stuff or high-end stuff, it's just expensive, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. But parts availability for GM stuff is like, you know, you don't really wait, you know. Plus, the nice thing about an LS engine is that if you, you literally you have, like, a really nice LS motor and you blow it up, you could at least go to the junkyard, get another one, and be racing the next week. If you have an exotic small block Chevy or a pretty awesome big, like you're not doing that with any other platform, maybe a Coyote, you know, but you're still going to spend four grand on a junkyard Coyote, you know, um, yeah. that's like the, like the sweet spot, sweet part about LS is that like, yeah, you can build a good motor and if you break it, you could still put another motor in it and it's just turn it down a little bit, <laughs> you know, and still be racing <laughs> the next weekend. You're not doing that with anything else. No big block, no nothing. Like there's not like a, like a strong big block Chevy that you're just going to go in there and throw 30 pounds of boost at it from the junkyard. You know, it's just not going to happen. So. Yeah, or you uh, could go run the U-Haul if you're at a race. You can that's go right. You U-Haul van and borrow you know, it's gonna be Gen 4. Well, actually, I don't know if you're going to be able to like, I mean, 2015, right. They had the Gen 4 or the Gen 5 motors in them. So that, that day's probably over. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the, the LS is getting kind of scarce now. <laughs> I know, they're not cheap. And it's funny because you know there used to yeah. be like five hundred bucks you get a six O, and now it's like twenty five hundred. Are you kidding me? For one hundred fifty thousand miles, six O twenty five hundred dollars now. Yeah, it's getting scarce. You guys blew them all up. <laughs> it was good while it lasted. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, uh, and the import guys. So it, yeah, if it's five for Chevy, ten for a Ford, twenty for a Mopar, import guys, it's like seventy. Yeah, I, I, I I'm not an import guy. I appreciate what other people do, but also that's just like the most self abusive thing to spend seventy grand on a Honda four cylinder to go ten seconds. Yeah, in my world. Not my cup of tea, but no, yeah, not for me. But I do appreciate the work and that that the, the, those guys do. And oh. I do I, as much as I'm not that guy to own one. Anytime I see a nine second fucking Honda Civic pull up, I go watch it. Oh yeah, with a whole I mean, bunch of enthusiasm because it is still cool as fuck. Oh, well, let's let's be fair. Those the the import guys are probably the mo- one of the most innovative guys out there and that's what i i appreciate it's not my thing but not at all okay i'm not in the four cylinder but like you look at the honda guys look at the dsm guys those guys are rubbing sticks together making shit happen and like the funniest thing is that i ever like you hear like moons and moons ago we messed around with hondas just because we would work on anything and then i had a good buddy that was into them so they ended up in our shop and on our dyno and stuff like that but they would take like a Suzuki Vitara 1.6 piston and that would fit in a, C- a D16 like four cylinder. And they would do it. They put like four H beam rods and then these like $35 Vitara eBay pistons that lowered the compression to like eight and a half to one. And they put like 30 pounds of boost to them. And that was like, there's a Vitara build. They would somehow, some way, they figured out that the piston from a Suzuki Vitara fit into the 1.6 Honda 
and that they were stronger than a factory piston and they were like forty dollars so they were putting these vitar like how how did that come about to figure that out but they did it's like oh, a right. thing they put a, a suzuki vitar piston on a on a stronger rod and then drop it in there and you know it's, i'm like okay you guys how how they do a Suzuki Vitar, and you're like, that piston looks really close to the other one. And man, it looks like it's got some more beefiness to it, more on the ring lamp. I bet we could put that in my Honda, and they did. Yeah, they do, they go right in, same wrist pin and oh. everything. So, yeah, no, definitely uh, resourceful and innovative. So, anybody else got any questions, or, or, or can we let Rick get back to his family? Yeah, you can put these kids to bed. Never, never listen to anything this guy says. Although it was good seeing you this weekend, brother. Is your Nova running yet? <laughs> I have a Plymouth Duster. Okay. And it, and people say it resembles a Nova or a Nova resembles a Duster, depending on who you ask. He knows it, <laughs> he knows it bothers me. I thought so many people go, oh man, look at that green Nova. Is that your green Nova? That is a Plymouth Duster. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is not a Nova. Uh, disrespectful, James. You're disrespectful. <laughs> Them fighting words. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. He wants to get me. He wants to get me going. Is what he, you know, like anybody doesn't know. James is my was is my service manager at the shop. So, so there's, there's going to be payback tomorrow. Is oh, what you're yeah. saying. Yep. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if we don't get any more questions, we'll let Rick get back to his family, and uh, we'll get ready for this week of racing. Whatever you guys are doing, I'll be at home. Uh, I'm not traveling this weekend. But uh, <laughs> James said, "If he's going to earn it, he's going to earn it tomorrow." Yeah, this is, this is, this, James is the big LS guy, but he does have a track hog. So let's not let's not talk about it. No. So I, I appreciate you letting me come on for the last five or six weeks or months or whatever, and let let me spiel and run my mouth. So. Um, no, no, we appreciate it, man. I've got a lot of good feedback uh, from people. So, to Joe, John, Joe, appreciate you. He's getting the flex fuel sensor tomorrow. I also, uh, I also have those in stock and plug and play harnesses, so you can just plug them in. It takes all the confusion out of them because the one thing about the flex fuel sensors, you have the wire resistor in there, and 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 there's since there's no more Radio Shack, you can't just go buy a resistor anymore. You got to right. order them. So I had some harnesses made um, that you could just buy and plug it into the flexual sensor, plug it into your little power tap and hook one wire up. So I sell the harness, the sensor in stock, OEM, non-knockoff ones for 150 bucks shipped. So if anybody needs them, just give us a shout. Are those on the website or are they got to call in and order them? No, I'll be honest. Our website just needs updated. <laughs> I just got to find somebody that could do that for me and I'll pay them. But uh Best bet, just shoot me a message or call in and we'll ship it out. We'll do the old school way of buying things, talking to a person. What's the uh, shop phone number? 330-220-3278 or 220-FAST or 220-FART if you're a dick. <laughs> so there you go. Call him tomorrow, Joe, and get yours ordered. Uh, no, certainly appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, I think we've... I think uh, we got to think of some more stuff for next winter and bring yeah, you back. For sure. uh, you got class. Are you done with classes for the year? I, or for I, the, uh, I might try to do one more, but it's tough with the, with all the track rentals and the racing. So I do them in the off season. I might not have another one until fall. I have a list of people that want to do it. So I might try to squeeze one more in this year. Thanks. All right. Make sure you let us know, man. And we'll, uh, we'll share it. Cool, I appreciate I'm sure, it. I'm sure everybody here wants to get in there. I, I enjoyed it, and I can't wait for him to put together an advanced class so I can go back. Yeah. Uh, definitely learned a lot. So, all right, buddy. We'll appreciate awesome. you. We'll let you guys uh, we'll let you get back to your kids. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you guys. Anytime, buddy. Thanks. 
So, all right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us this week. Uh, yeah, I, I won't be. I won't be at any uh, races. Well, if there's some street stuff pops off, adulting will have to get put on hold. But otherwise, I'll be home adulting this weekend. Maybe I'll go work on the blazer. Uh, maybe I'll go work on the be able to work on the blazer Saturday morning or something. So we, and and I'll go live. Uh, I'll make sure you're banned until you get the hair under control. <laughs> But uh, otherwise, I don't know what we'll talk about Monday, but we'll talk about something. Yeah, I know. Stinking. If I hit the lottery, man, I'm building the Thunderdome. I tried to do the Thunderdome race a couple years ago, which was awesome, and rain fucked us. Had six had six teams and with six cars on each team that were going to battle it out for points and it was a pretty i mean this was four or five years ago at, at that point i think it was like eighty five hundred dollar pot which was huge and mother nature fucked us twice on that one but I'm, if i ever hit the lottery for a lot of money i'm going to build a thunder dome i'm going to build an indoor drag strip and we'll never have to worry about that again or i'll go uh i'll go up to detroit and, and buy one of those abandoned factories that's like seven miles long and, and, and we'll race in those year round I know man I'm still bummed about that I still want to do that one day it's gotta it was gonna be a great time uh, yeah I know stupid rain but so anyhow we'll see you guys all next Monday same channel same time hopefully facebook doesn't cancel the fucking live feed again i don't know what their deal is but have a great week everyone remember be kind to each other support each other love each other and uh stay away from those dicks unless you're that guy he never can stay away from them <laughs> all right everyone